let me uh, kind of run through uh, what I do. I run a boutique consulting firm in the Valley. We specialize in helping companies with machine learning and AI, uh, mentorship, executive consulting projects, these kinds of things. I uh, worked with a lot of different companies. We worked with a company, Aardvark, was acquired by Google. Uh, the first billion I worked with Demand Media, the first billion dollar IPO since Google. So I've been doing machine learning in the industry for a very long time. Uh, and I met Michael. Uh, uh, I think everyone here, maybe you don't know Michael. You can talk about what we are. Michael's sort of, this, to me, the world expert in matrix, random matrix theory, or excuse me, randomized matrix algorithms and regularization machine learning. And we met um, a few years ago at a conference and just started getting talking about this stuff. And uh, you know, we, we, sort of the motivation for this talk came from, for me, sort of a paper that came out by Lee Kun, who of course is one of the founders of this, of this field. And it was about uh, this modeling neural networks as a spin glass. And I, I had also, in addition to a PhD, I did my postdoctoral work at Champaign-Urbana, where we you know, did theor a theoretical physics group that looked at the statistical mechanics of things like spin glasses and neural nets and protein folding. And when I read Lee Kun's paper, I realized, well, this looks like a protein folding problem. This doesn't look like a spin glass. And I sort of, uh, uh, you know, we talked to Michael at a conference, and he had also worked on protein folding uh, many years ago. And he said, yeah, this looks like protein folding, and in, in particular related to something called energy landscape theory. And I, I wrote a blog post on this back in 2015, which is basically saying, why does deep learning work? It's related to something we understand, energy landscape theory. I got my 15 minutes of fame on Hacker News, and then we started working on this problem. And in, in terms of trying to develop uh, a theory of deep learning, you know, there, I mean, there are a number of deep problems that arise. You know, is this just some kind of non-convex optimization problem? How does regularization work in these systems? Because it seems to be quite different than uh, what Michael might be familiar with and what we see in machine learning. Uh, why are deeper systems, why are deeper networks better? And then from a, a more deeper question, what's the right theoretical framework? I think it's come out now that uh, VC theory doesn't seem to work. Uh, and I, I would argue that was known 20 years ago, it doesn't work. We did, we approached these problems in the 90s using statistical mechanics and the statistical mechanics of generalization. And Michael and I have a paper on this where we talk about sort of what we think is going on from the statistical mechanics perspective. But you know, I, I also work in industry. So the point of having a theory is it has to be useful. And I look at VC theory, go, oh, I'm gonna compute the VC bounds. I, I, what am I supposed to do with this? I can't apply this to anything. So in terms of, you know, we've been sort of talking on every week for about three years trying to come up with not only a theory of why this works, but to provide some sort of useful insight for practitioners who are doing this. And so that's what I hope to talk about today and convince you that this is something you, should actually, you can actually start using. So begin by setting up the problem, just looking at what, what is the deep learning problem, what are we looking at? Well, we have an energy landscape. Uh, we have these weight matrices W and activation functions H. And we put together uh, the, um, you know, you, you basically have some data, you feed the data into the network, it goes through uh, an activation, it, 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 you, it goes through these activation functions and these weights, and you get an energy. You, maybe you're doing a supervised problem, so you're trying to train it on some labels where this is, say, zero or one. And you minimize some loss function where you take the energy, which depends on the data, minus the label. And this is, it's a, so it looks like a typical optimization problem. And, and the issue here is, well, we, we have to minimize this, but we want to avoid overtraining because this is, uh, seemingly, a, uh, this is seemingly impossible to do. I mean, it, it, if you look at this very naively, you would say, well, this is some sort of highly non-convex optimization problem. Well, but if you, you know, it, it, of course, we knew 20 years ago that there was not a problem in convex optimization. This was not, the issue was not trying to find well, the issue wasn't getting trapped in local minima. This, this is actually has been suspected for a long time. In fact, I dug up a very famous book uh, by Duda Hart, Duda Hart and Stork from 2000. This is the second edition. And you know, it's a big, you know, in low basically the point is in low dimensional spaces, local minima can be plentiful. In high dimensional spaces, the problem of local minima is different. The high dimensional space may afford more ways or dimensions for the system to get around a barrier or local maximum during training. So the, the point is that, um, uh, so we say the more superfluous the weights, the less likely it is a network will get trapped in local minima. However, networks with an unnecessarily large number of weights are undesirable because of the dangers of overfitting. And you know, this was known, no, 20 years ago this was known. So the, the question isn't, 
There's a, this broad open question of how in the world can you solve this giant non-convex non -convex optimization problem. You get a solution, it's stable, and yet it, it actually generalizes quite well. And of course, the, the standard solution to machine learning is to generalize, uh, excuse me, to add more capacity and then to regularize. So what, what does that mean? Well, in deep learning, everything is regularization. You know, every knob and switch you can adjust is, is called regularization. You know, you have dropout, oh, that's regularization. You, you change, you decrease the batch size, that's regularization. Well, I mean, w there aren't other, in traditional optimization problems, decreasing the batch size is not regularization. You, you noisify the data. So there was a paper where you add random label, you randomize the labels, that's a type of regularization. In fact, I have a reference here. There's a taxonomy, I think of like 50 or 60 different techniques used in deep learning, all of which are regularization. So we start off, first you have to understand what something is before you can begin to probe what's going on. So we start off with, um, in particular, uh, we started looking at this problem because there was a paper in 2017, the best paper, which showed that when you have a very large model, a deep learning system, and you randomly label, say, 10% of the data, 10% right? of the labels are randomized, you can't undo the problem. You can't, the, the deep network will always overtrain, and regularization cannot prevent this. So you have this very, very strange phenomenon, which doesn't exist in other systems. Typically, you would think that, well, you randomize some of the labels, but if I just keep turning on more and more regularization, I at least should get some answer, which isn't maybe not too accurate, but it's not just completely, you know, not completely overtrained. But these deep learning systems always overtrain. And we, we wrote a paper on this, uh, suggesting this is related to something called a phase transition in statistical mechanics. But it, it's very clear that to really understand deep learning and what's going on, we need to understand what is regularization. So, you know, we start off um, uh, at the beginning. What, what do we typically think of regularization? We, we think of it in terms of ridge regression or Tinkinoff Phillips regularization. So, I mean, imagine you're trying to solve some sort of simple linear system, you know, W, X equals Y. Well, you, you form the more pen, you, you form W transpose W, and you invert that, you get the more Penrose inverse. I'm not going to step in front of that again. Uh, and then you regularize that by adding in a parameter, alpha, and that allows you to um, rewrite the problem in terms of this new, more familiar optimization problem where you minimize WX minus Y uh, plus this term, which is a, a weight norm regularizer. And what this lets you do is it lets you focus the attention on the larger eigenvalues of the weight matrix. The idea being that the eigenvectors associated with the large eigenvalues are where most of the information is. So this gives you a way of setting a scale in your matrix. And this is typically what we think of regularization, is this idea that there's some sort of scale, and when you're below the scale, you're noise, and when you're above the scale, you have information. And so it's okay, this is what we think about as regularization, okay, this is um, a, a, a traditional, simple, operational way of looking at it. Um, how would we study this? Well, we're, we're going to take a typical um, uh, deep learning network and we'll just turn off all the regularization. We'll, we'll, we'll turn everything off and then we'll systematically turn the regularization back on. So for example, we might turn on a type of weight norm regularization. Uh, we might turn on dropout. We might decrease the batch size and see what happens. And then we examine the energy landscape and we try to understand how does regularization affect the energy landscape? Okay, well, that seems like a, a good place to start. Well, how would we study the energy landscape? The energy landscape is very, very complicated. It's this complicated convolution of weights and activations. Well, let's just look at the, the weight layer matrices. So why, wh what, what do other people do when they study this? Well, there is this, um, this idea of there being an information bottleneck. That is, you know, you try to study the total amount of information by looking at, say, the mutual information between the weight matrices in each layer. Uh, now, we, I had proposed, and Mike and I, at a talk with and Michael was happened uh, nice enough to put together in 2016 that this actually looks to me like something called entropy collapse, which is a very familiar problem that arises in problems like polymer theory, protein theory, uh, excuse me, protein folding, polymer folding. It arrives in statistical field theory. So the idea being that as you minimize the energy, you're also minimizing some form of the entropy or the information. So you get this bottleneck that occurs as, as the system is training. And I think this is becoming now a, 
uh, a pretty standard picture, uh, especially with the work by Tishby, for example, about what's happening in deep learning. But, okay, so the information decreases, that's a fairly coarse grain thing. But what, what happens to the weight matrices themselves? What happens to the energy landscape when this is going on? In, in particular, we might want to know where are all the local minima? Um, there's some thought right now that all the local minima concentrate at the bottom near the ground state. And that somehow this is the, that the, you, you don't have any local, all that basically you run a deep network. You never are in the global minima. You just find a local minima. Any local minima will do, and they're all concentrated near the ground state. And, and that is a fairly, uh, it's not clear that that's the correct picture. So um, what we do is we're, we're going to run some self regular we're going to call them regularization experiments or self-regularization experiments. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna take uh, a couple of small models. We're going to build a three-layer, multi-layer perceptron. We're going to build a mini version of AlexNet. And we even retrained an original version of Lynette 5, which is one of the first convolutional networks that Lee Kun developed back in the late 90s. And, and these networks have a particular structure to them. They're a convolutional layer, max pool, convolutional layer, max pool, fully connected layer, fully connected layer, um, and, and, then, and then connect to the labels at the end. So it has this idea that it's a, it's a deep net. These are models for deep nets. They're not that deep. They're sort of small. You know, but we have to sort of shrink them so we don't overtrain because we're training them unminced. And we're going we're gonna to study these by turning off the regularization completely. But you know, it, it, with the other thing we want to do is we want to look at actual pre-trained models. I mean, looking at toy models is not something I, you know, you have to look at things that are trained. AlexNet, Inception, ResNet, um, dense, DenseNet 201. You, can we, we want a theory that actually lets us look at production size models. So, and what are we going to measure? Well, the first thing we want to do is show that we want me some measure of the entropy or the information collapse. So you can measure the matrix entropy. That's just you know, uh, P log P, where the P is defined from the, the squares of the singular values of W or the eigenvalues of a correlation matrix. And, and if, you, if, you measure, um, if, if you measure the entropy, you would find that it, you know, as, you, as you do basic training, the entropy of the, we look at the, the, the last two layers. So we're going to look at these layers right here, these fully connected layers, the ones right at the end where, where the information is being concentrated. And we find that, you know, as you look at them, the, um, the, the second to last layer decreases slowly in entropy, and the last layer, the, the, so this is the third to last layer, the second to last layer, FC1, FC2, goes quite down. Okay, that's good. We're, we've got, we're, we're, we're in the ballpark of what we want to do. We can also look at a measure Michael suggested called the soft rank, which is just the ratio of the Frobenius norm and the spectral norm. And you see the same behavior. In fact, it's even amplified. You see that, or, or excuse me, the stable rank. And you see that you get a collapse in rank. So what's happening is as you train these systems, the matrices are losing rank. But they're not losing hard rank. They're just losing soft rank. They're, they're beginning to look less and less random, and they're picking up structure. And you know, to, to a physicist, old physicist like me, this begins to look like a phase transition. But this isn't the whole story. This is just sort of setting it up. What we really care about is what happens during this process. So we want to go inside and look at the weight matrices. So I put some code in here. What we do is we're, we're going to look at the eigenvalues of the correlation matrix. We're going to form x, which is w transpose w, and we're going to look at the, its eigenvalues, uh, what I, what's called the empirical spectral density. And so this is basic code. You know, like if you were running this in Keras, you would model layers, get the weights. You'd run NP dot to give you the correlation matrix, and you'd use W, tr w times W transpose or W transpose times W, depending on you know, which is smaller. You'd compute the eigenvalue spectrum, and then you plot a histogram. And you can do this on every iteration or every few iterations while you're training. It's actually yeah, it's pretty fast. Um, these, these matrices are, you know, even if they're like 5,000 by 5,000 or so, the, the, these are fairly, you can yeah, just do it in your laptop. These are fairly small calculations. And if you do this, well, you, you see what is a shift from you start off with something which is a random matrix, and you have this sort of semi this uh, sort of semicircular like pattern. And as soon as you begin decreasing entropy, you start seeing these spikes appear in the matrix. And you start, they get larger, it goes from three to four, and they start getting larger. And, and you'll see the variance of this will actually shrink just a little bit. And so at the end of training on these small models, you end up with something which like random plus spikes. 
And, and I think this would make sense. I mean, you know, the, the entropy decrease corresponds to a breakdown of the random structure of the matrix. And we call this self-regularization uh, be, because you're going to show that this is actually characteristic of, of Tinkanoff regularization. This is going to look very similar. But this is only for small models you begin to see this. Um, now, it turns out, before I get to the, the larger models, it turns out that this can be described using random matrix theory. And this is the workhorse of what we're going to do. We're going to apply random matrix theory to analyze the spectral density of these deep learning systems. We're going to look at these toy models, and we're going to look at some very large production models, and we're going to apply random matrix theory and see what we, what we learn. I, I knew this because I used to be a quant at BlackRock, and we did this for things like denoising the correlation matrix when you're trying to do portfolio theory. And there's a very, very broad, very rich theory of random matrix theory, which is very nice to draw upon in an applied context. And this is a lot of the motivation for where this comes from. So the idea is you form x, you form the eigenvalues. Uh, so x times little x, so vector is lambda i times x. And you, and you compute this density function, which is a function of the w, the original matrix, being an n by m matrix. Well, it, it turns out random matrix theory is quite nice. It shows you that as n goes to infinity and you fix the aspect ratio n over, n over m, and that thing's usually greater than equal to 1, you converge to a deterministic density. It's a density that you know. It's deterministic. And it's only determined by the aspect ratio and the variance of the element, the element-wise variance of your matrix. So this is, um, and we're going to have a paper coming out soon, and we're going to discuss this in more detail, presenting random matrix theory and explaining some of the more caveats of how this works. But this is a very, very, the takeaway for a talk is that you can actually apply this to small finite matrices, and it works very, very well. And there are some very um, deep theoretical reasons for this. Uh, in particular, let's get a picture of what this looks like when you ask, what do these eigenvalue distributions look like when you're random? Well, the, here's an example of one where, I, I got to stop doing that. Um, here's an example. You see the, the, re, the red line is when you have just uh, Q is 1. So you have a, a, rec, you have a square matrix, and it's, it's somewhat long tail. Um, it's a little long tail. When you start in, Increasing the aspect ratio, the, the matrix becomes more rectangular, and it begins to squeeze. And you have this, this, you have this plot where the eigenvalues are bounded between lambda minus and lambda plus. So there's a very tight bound on those eigenvalues. If you go back to some of these plots, you'll see, you begin to see like the random matrix, you'll see that the, they're bounded here between you know, like 1 and 3, 1 and 2 and a half, basically. But you also have the nice, the finite size results that tell you that the, that tell you that the, um, the edge is very, very crisp. The edge scales as m to the minus 2 thirds plus something called tracy Witten fluctuation. So when you see these random matrices and you evaluate them, you know if there's a, there's a very, very crisp edge. And in our case, I think it, in units of sigma m to the minus 2 thirds is like 0 0.02. So you can really tell when things start to break down. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to apply this to a wide range of pre-trained models. You know, we've, I've applied this to all of them. Lynette 5, we retrained Lynette 5. It's not widely available. But AlexNet, um, uh, Inception, VGG16, VGG19, ResNet, DenseNet201. You can actually you can go to Keras. You can go or TensorFlow or Cafe. You can get the models and you can look at them. Uh, so what do you see? Well, uh, this is, uh, but, and, and the point is, I, I point this out, that models like Lynette 5 are, uh, are similar, to AlexNet and in, uh, similar to AlexNet in the sense that they have this convolution max pool, convolution max pool, con fully connected layer, fully connected layer architecture. And, these, and AlexNet in 2012 is sort of the model that really kicked off a lot of the deep learning craze. They were able to get this really tremendous accuracy uh, when applied to one of these uh, big um, applied to ImageNet. Models like Inception, ResNet, DenseNet, they have very, very different architectures. So, you know, but these are sort of as you, you can still, and, and these take a while to train. Um, I mean, I guess you're here, you know, if you have, have 600,000 cores, it doesn't take that long to train. But, uh, uh, you know, these, these are the models we want to look at. And, and we're particularly, we want to have a theory that lets us look at pre-trained models. I mean, that's one of the advantages. I mean, you know, what, you know, I, 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 
you, know, you can't just look at these little toy models, and you're going to find out that you see very, very different results. So for example, if you look at Lynette 5, uh, which is the first model trained by Lee Kun in the late 90s, and has been used for things like, used particularly for um, OCR on numbers, like, like when you read the numbers on a check. You write your check and you put it in the bank. You use OCR. And then the, these models were known to work, and they were known to generalize pretty well in the 90s. You see this sort of area where you have this red area, which fits the marchenko pasteur theory very well. It fits the random matrix theory very well. And then you have these spikes that appear all the way out from lambda max way out here. They, they go way out. And, and this is characteristic of the small models we have. It's characteristic of the small multilayer perceptron or this small version of AlexNet, where you get a, fit, a nice fit to the marchenko pasteur bulk and you get some spikes. If, however, you look at AlexNet, you see very different behavior. In AlexNet, this is the FC1, FC2, and AlexNet FC1, you can, you can kind of get a fit to marchenko pasteur but you have this, this region that is not really, it's just not, you just can't fit that, that region bleeding out there. And if you look at FCC, and these are, by the way, these are zoomed in. So in fact, the eigenvalues go way out to like 30. If you look at uh, the second layer, FC, FC2 in AlexNet, there's no, there's no Marchenko Pasteur fit using the, the standard theory. This is a heavy tail, as a heavy tail distribution. So you either get in the modern network, you either see a breakdown or a perturbative breakdown of, of random matrix theory, bulk plus decay, or you're going to see heavy tailed, which doesn't seem to be described as a theory at all. If you look at other models, like Inception V3, there's another one here. We look at uh, one of the, the square matrices in Inception, in, deep inside Incep Inception V3, um, layer 226. You also see something that looks like it might be Marchenko Pasteur, but it has, you know, it, it, it has this large spike near zero. It has a sort of, it doesn't quite fill in the bulk. And you have these eigenvalues going out. So this, this is clearly something which is more like the bulk decay and the onset of heavy-tailed behavior in these eigenvalues, in the eigenvalue spectrum of these deep networks. So, oh, and, and in particular, um, what's also very interesting about these models is you don't see rank collapse. We, you know, if, if you look at the smallest eigenvalues, you have to use the numerical recipes threshold for this. If you use the default Python threshold, it, it, I think it's off. But you, you don't see rank collapse. These eigenvalues don't go to zero. As long as Q is greater than one, your eigenvalues in random matrix theory should not go to zero. But you definitely see what is almost a, almost a rank collapse. You're like just near rank collapse. And we have other cases if you look at, if you over-regularize, you will in fact see you just the Marchenko theory breaks down and you just see a spike at zero. So you basically see rank collapse. But in all of the modern deep networks we look at, they all, all the layers look like this. They all have this heavy tailed behavior. Sometimes it's a good heavy tail, sometimes it has, it's not quite filled in, and you never see rank collapse. So from this, we've put together a taxonomy. Uh, I call it the five plus one phases of training. And what I'm gonna show is that you can actually take a small network and by tuning the regularization parameters, in particular tuning the batch size, you can force it to go through all of these phases of training. So you can start with something that looks very random. It's a random, like it looks like, this like be your initial weight matrix, or a case where you have a very, very large batch size. And so there's not a lot of correlations, or if there are correlations, you can't really observe them. As you start, decreasing the batch size or other, uh, turning on other forms of regularization, you start seeing the Marchenko pasture theory breaking down. You see this bleeding out. And the bleeding out is much larger than what you would expect from the finite size corrections in the theory. You then, after you add more regularization, you start seeing spikes appear. And by the way, these, these are, I, I didn't point out, these are ensemble plots. So we took a small model and you run it 10, 20, 30 times over and over again so we can get a nice, pretty plot like this. But you see the same thing if you just look at a single matrix and you analyze it. It's just, you don't get as nice, pretty pictures. Um, you see, you start seeing a bulk plus spike as you start, to, and this, you start seeing in this section, see, this is what we see in smaller models, like the original models from the 90s, the Lynette 5. Um, those of you who might be familiar, this is actually, there's a name for this. It's called the spiked covariance model. And it's very, very well known in machine learning as a model for certain kinds of, certain kinds of problems. Then you really start turning the regularization up. You start seeing a decay. You see this, this bulk decay. And this, this actually can be described um, 
using some, I, using some results in random matrix theory from polymer theory, which starts to show is as you start seeing stronger correlations, you're going to start seeing a power law breakdown. And eventually you get to a heavy tail distribution. And this, this arises when you, know, you have a, in, in a theory, you, know, you, you, start, you see these heavy tails in all of these, uh, so mo all of these modern networks. So most of the modern networks go from here. That when they start, they have to start here because you start with a random initialization unless you're doing something fancy with your weight matrix, with the initial weight conditions. And you end up either in this bulk decay or this heavy tailed situation. And then there are other situations if you apply too strong of a regularization, you get a singularity. You, 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 the, you actually get rank collapse. So we call this the five plus one phases of training. And this is a, a taxonomy we put together so that practitioners, when they're tuning their regularization parameters, can get some idea of where they are. Now, there's actually quite a bit of theory we try to put together um, to explain what's going on here. And we start off by looking at the bulk plus spikes. In, in random matrix theory, this is well known uh, that you can describe this. It's, uh, I can never remember the name, the BPP phase transition, which arises. But I, I know it from physics because you, you can describe this using perturbation theory. If you assume you have a rank one perturbation and the perturbation is greater than m, m to the 1 fourth, you can prove that the lambda max uh, before we had an equation for lambda max which just depend on sigma and q, it also depends on the size of this rank one perturbation. And so theory tells us when you have a small perturbation to a random matrix, you will begin to see spikes. And so we know this from theory, that there's, a lot, there's some good theory that says it, and it can be a little more generalized, but under these kinds of simple conditions, when you have the correlations in a, in a weight matrix start to become larger, uh, large enough, you begin to see their appearance. And again, this is what we see this is characteristic of what we saw in these small models like those that were popular in the late 90s when, when you know, I was your age in a postdoc. We also see uh, that, for a minute, for some of you, you know, maybe not Michael, you know. <laughs> some of you. When I was a postdoc, this is what we saw. We did, we did statistical mechanics of neural networks at the supercomputing center, and this is what we saw. We also find that the spikes that are associated with these eigenvalues, they have less entropy, or they're more localized. And so this is another reason why we did these ensemble plots. You can, measure the, you can measure the distribution of the entropy. So you can measure the entropy of the vector. I did that just by using a, um, a histogram estimator. You took the vector, use a histogram estimator. I can compute the entropy, p log p, from that. And in the paper, we'll describe how that's done. Or you, or you can look at these various norms, like the, nor the ratio, this localization ratio, which is the ratio of the one norm to the infinity norm, or the participation ratio, which is the ratio of the vector of the two norms of the four norm. All of these are very nice. The, the, these are actually, you know, these, all, all of them give basically the same result. You see that information begins to concentrate in the spikes. You get more information. Please. There's less entropy in the spike than in the bulk. Right, because the bulk is more random. No, 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 no. This is just, I'm, you know, I work in industry. I just thought, how can I measure the entropy? Oh, I'll just use an estimator. That's, okay. So now we want to relate, what does this have to do with regularization? Okay, think about what we do in Tinkanoff regularization. We set a threshold on the eigenvalues. There's this thing alpha, which is your threshold. Well, alpha's going to like lambda max from Marchenko Pasteur theory. Uh, you have a little bit of a softer rank here in the bulk. And for the spikes, the eigenvectors associated with the eigenvalues greater than alpha. The spikes carry most of the information. This is what you would expect when you're, this is sort of the idea when you're doing Tinkanoff regularization. You set a scale threshold, eigenvalues and eigen, eigen, eigenvectors associated with eigenvalues larger than that scale threshold. They carry most of the information. Those that are below the threshold, they still carry some information. It's not, it's not like you're doing SVD and truncating it. You're still seeing it's just it's just this scale tells you where the bulk of the information is, and this and then you tune that alpha parameter in practice. You know you do it for Tinkanoff regularization, you do it for an SVM, this kind of thing. And this is how you do traditional regularization. And we say that we believe that small models like Lynette five would remember that we're doing this without any regularization on the model. We're just running the model um, as is, and we're, we're we don't have batch norm, we don't have dropout, we don't have weight norm regularization. We, we see this already. So we call this a form of self-regularization that arises. This is the structure that occurs when the information is beginning to decrease as you, as you train. 
The larger models are, are more interesting, and this is a phenomenon I, called, uh, I call heavy-tailed self-regularization. So this is the second idea of the talk, is that when you get to larger models, you, what you expect is that the weight matrices are very strongly correlated, which means that they're, very non, they're highly non-random. Now, in fact, you can model non -random, a non-random matrix as if you were to draw the weight matrix instead of from a Gaussian distribution, you draw from a heavy-tailed distribution. Uh, and, this is, and, and if you were to draw W from a heavy tail distribution, you would find that the marchenko pasteur theory also has a heavy tail distribution. In fact, I, I was coming to Michael, in fact, if, if you have an infinite variance and you model W as if it has an infinite variance, there are actually no finite size effects. Uh, the marchenko pasteur theory is exact because the, the variance dominates everything, at all, even at small sizes. And now these are known results. I, I, I worked in Chicago. My advisor was a polymer theorist. And we also did protein folding. And these are known results from polymer theory and, and from protein folding theory that you get these heavy tails. And you use these heavy tail models to model strongly correlated systems. So I'm, I'm not saying that W is drawn from a heavy tail distribution. I'm saying a heavy tail distribution is a good model for describing the strong correlations in W. And I'm also saying that you know from random matrix theory, if you were to draw from a heavy tail distribution, you would see instead of the normal marchenko pasteur cutoff, you would see this long, instead of seeing this marchenko pasteur you see a heavy tail distribution. And in fact, you can even do more. You can characterize it based on, uh, you can actually characterize bulk decay versus heavy tail, depending on how, how much correlation there is. And this is what we're seeing. We're seeing this in AlexNet, ResNet 50, Inception V3. All these models, we begin to see this in one form or another. So, so we have this, this conjecture. It's not a conjecture, it's an observation, that all the large, well-trained, modern, deep neural networks exhibit this sort of heavy-tailed self-regularization. Look at on time, we're doing good. So, so there, there are some salient ideas about this, so what we suspect is going on. We suspect that in, in, in this type of regularization that's going in these, network, in these neural networks, there's no scale threshold. There isn't a scale where this is where I regularize, I throw this is noise and this is not. This is more like being on the edge of a phase transition, where you have correlations arising on all link scales. So all the link scales matter in these systems. Moreover, we sort of conjecture that there's no simple low-rank approximation that you can use for W, or as I with Michael, no, no rank approximation that won't get me fired from my job. You know, it has to work. So there's no good low-rank approximation for these matrices. You see correlations. And, and moreover, you can't treat the system perturbatively. So in other words, I, I'm not going to be able to come up with some sort of perturbation theory where I describe, well, here's W, here are the correlations, and then I can make a low rank, I can make a low rank approximation using some fancy perturbation theory, uh, which I, I did a lot of when I was in grad school. Uh, so what we're going to do now, this is sort of our conjecture. This is where we are and what we think is going on. I'm going to run some, I'm going to demonstrate some experiments where we actually can exhibit this in small models. And I thought the interesting thing we'd do would be batch size experiments. Uh, people want to run neural networks at large batch sizes. That's a huge problem. You know, because you basically, for those who don't know how this works, you have these GPUs, and you're running the neural networks on the GPU, and the GPU has a certain amount of memory. You'd like to optimize how much of the data you can get into the memory during a batch. So you'd like to run large batch sizes. And so it would be much faster and much more efficient. So there's a phenomenon in deep learning called the generalization gap phenomenon. And what it means is that as you increase the batch size, say like from like a normal batch size of like 50 or 64 up to like 500, you see significant decreases in accuracy. And this is a rather puzzling thing because you wouldn't think if you're just running an optimization problem and you change the batch size on your solver, you, you would think you'd get better accuracy if you have more batches. You'd get better estimates of the variance. But in fact, you get actually worse accuracy when you decrease the batch size, I mean, when you increase the batch size. So what we're doing is we're going to run some experiments where we start off with, say, a batch size of, uh, you know, batch size of 500, and, we, and this is at the end of training. And we, don't, we can't observe any of the correlations in the model. And of course, I don't have the, the plot of the generalization accuracy. The generalization accuracy is not very good. But it's not zero. I mean, it's, it, it, it's not zero. It does generalize. It's just not very good. Then we start decreasing the batch size. We go down to 250, and we go down to 100. We don't see anything. We go down to 100, we start seeing this bleeding out effect. 
Well, we go all the way down to two. And as you go down, you see you can actually exhibit all of the phases. We can go from uh, bleeding out to something that looks like the spiked or the spiked covariance or bulk model. Then we begin to see the formation of heavy tails. And then I can drive it all the way down to where I see the heavy tail. And I only see a sig even a minute decrease in accuracy here. But it's like 0.001% you know, because like we're, we're studying on minced. So as you see, you have this, you get down to a reasonable batch size like 50. You start seeing bulk plus spikes. That's, that's typical scale, a scaled type regularization, to cone off regularization. You start decreasing the batch size more. And remember, this is a small model, so you know, we're trying to squeeze it out. You know, we're, not, we're not suggesting you run it at small batch sizes. We're, trying, we're running these small models. You start seeing this effect. And you can squeeze out the, um, you start seeing the onset of heavy tail. So this indicates to me that now, if my theory is correct, you know, uh, even like Mike said, at least I'm a little better than halfway there, like maybe 51% correct, that you start seeing the onset of correlations which are strong enough to start making the MP theory exhibit this sort of heavy tail. Um, then as you decrease the batch size, you, you can get it all the way to where there's no way to fit Marchenko posture at all. It's, it's completely heavy tail. And this is consistent. You know, there are other regularization techniques you can use. But the, we thought the batch size would be a really nice demonstration because it's so interesting to, to people because they want to do it. And, and so you know, other effects, you know, we, we, we have in a paper we're trying to write, which I think is like 50 pages now. I try to you know, throw every other word away. But you know, we, we, we do drop out, you know, so I get, get it, cut it down. You know? I mean, I give it to industry. I, I told Michael in our last paper, we should just make a tweet, you know, like Donald Trump. You should just read the original literature. This is what's going on. This tweet, that's the whole paper. So, but you know, we do study like dropout, weight norm regularization, other things, and we see we can observe these kinds of effects. And sort of, sort of what you know what, what we expect. You know, the question is, you know, what, what would you do? How would you actually apply this in production? The, the idea is that if you're trying to 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 do something like run a large batch size, what you want to do is turn on other regularization effects. And you want to blow, you can increase the batch size. You probably have to adjust the learning rate at the same time and the amount of momentum because those two things are related. I didn't fool with the learning rate when I was doing this. And then you turn on other regular, you know, when you go to large batch size, you know, you might say, I get the batch size, it becomes random. Okay, well, now I'll start turning the other knobs in my, that I have for regularization until I try to get it to get, at least give me some spikes or maybe get to something like bulk to care heavy tailed. So, it, so the idea is to provide some sort of operational metric so you can monitor what you're doing and figure out whether the, whether the system is going to generalize better or not. And, and remember, we're, we're talking about doing this without looking at any data. We're not peeking at the, train, at the test data. So we're doing this, this is completely, it's an unsupervised metric, which is what I think was very important for the theory. You know, we, we don't want to leak information. Part of the problem with running any kind of uh, uh, regularization, boy, you see this in industry all the time, you leak, even, even in some of these Kaggle contests, you'll leak information from the test set back to the training data. And then, you know, so this, there's, no, there's no test set here. We're just saying we believe, we conject, this is a conjecture, you know, maybe a hypothesis. I call it a theory. Maybe I'll say a hypothesis can take half. That, that if you do this and you adjust your regularization knobs and you get a heavy tailed phenomenon in your weight matrix, you see this in the spectral density, you should get good generalization. Now, how do you apply this? You know, there's some operational things you need to do. You need to kind of understand the theory a bit. Uh, one of the things you realize, you always want to be at, at a larger aspect ratio. When Q is 1, uh, it's a little trickier to do. It, it still works, but you just got to be aware that when Q is 1, the eigenvalues will go to 0. Oh, I don't, it doesn't. The, the minimum eigenvalue up here, it's always great. In, in particular posture, it's always greater than 0 if Q is greater than 1. And when Q is 1, it's 0. Um, you're going to be, what we recommend is fixing Q and adjusting sigma. And the idea being that you start off with a random matrix. You have a certain amount of variance. You, as you train, you might expect the variance to decrease a little. You kind of have to be careful with that because you know, when you're doing SGD training, you really don't have any control over the variance. I mean, people try to do batch norm, and they think batch norm might control the variance. But you know, the variance of these weight matrices can shift in training. And, and so. Be aware of that. You know, it's not like you set it to one; it's always one. You have you have to be careful of monitoring what's going on because you're you know, you're not fixing it to be one, unless you're doing some particular regularization technique which does that. 
and, and you realize that you have these very, very crisp edges. So you can, you can get an idea of what the order fluctuates, you know, how good should your Marchenko mustard cutoff be. And if you wanted to, you could even dig in and look at the Tracy Whitman fluctuations. But of course, you'd have to do an ensemble run to do that. We, we don't suggest that, but we, we kind of do that in the paper. But basically, you're going to get a cutoff. And the idea is that you look and you try to do some fit. So for example, with Inception, uh, I try to tell Michael, it looks heavy tail. He goes, no, just, just, just make the eigenvalue. If you, if, you put the, if you put the cutoff lambda max there, and you fit sig member, and you set Q, well, sigma is no longer, as soon as you pick lambda max, and Q is fixed, the variance is not a free adjustable parameter. The variance is set by the theory. So there's no adjustment of the variance. It's just, you see, you miss the bulk. You don't get the bulk. It doesn't capture it. And if you set the eigenvalue to 10, and you have Q fixed, well, you, you still have this double this heavy tail, and you still don't get the bulk. So this starts to look like a heavy tailed, a heavy -tailed um, distribution. Well, you might, okay, and well, here, here's another example of, um, uh, of Q equals one. Excuse me, the, uh, Q, wrong, yeah, this is right. Here's an example where you try to look at, um, uh, no, this is just another example from DenseNet. Uh, so this slide is a little screwy. So uh, the, the point of the slide is you're, you're trying to ask, well, what happens here? You're, you're going to find that you don't really, uh, you should not see much rank collapse. You know, Q here, it's kind of like, it looks like it might be 1. But it's not. You know, it's actually in this model, it's 1.92. And yet you still seems like it might be a Q equals 1. You might think, oh, if I decrease this, if I decrease Q and fix sigma, I can get a good fit. Um, because it sort of looks like a Q equals one uh, fit. So if you do that, uh, and, and the point is that this is sort of what, what happens when Q equals one, in order to get a very, very long tail fit, you have to start increasing the variance. So uh, in here, the, the purple line is, for example, variance equal two gets you out here, and then you start having to get larger and larger variance. In other words, your variance starts to diverge. So if you do a Q equals one fit, you start doing the best fit on this, on this layer, for example, in Inception. This is back to the Inception layer, Inception 302. Q is two, about 204, eight, about 205. And this is the best Marchenko Pasteur fit with Q fixed. You still see the spike. You get a cutoff around six. You have heavy tails, but it's not really, a, maybe not a clean power law, but you, you still, because it's got a little bump right there. But it goes all the way out to 30. If you then try to refit it, and you set Q equal one, well, you know, you, you, you get this section, but you don't really get the bulk correctly, and you still get a cutoff. And if you start screwing, if you start trying to, so you, you start trying to tweak the sigma, you would find that the variance goes way, in order to get out here, you have to have huge variances, which is again this idea that, you know, the variance is diverging. So this is how you apply the theory. The, you know, I'll, I'll produce some code when we, when we, Publish, I have some code that basically does the Marchenko Pasteur fits. You can just put the matrix, matrix, weight matrix in. You ask, here's what I want sigma to be, or here's what I want the eigenvalue cut off, and you can look. And you'll be able to just look right at the matrix. So sort of the summary, the practical parts of this are that um, we, we apply random matrix theory to analyze the weight matrices of deep neural networks. And we want to apply, we want to apply it in a way to try to understand what's happening during the training process. And we have identified this phenomenon we, we call self-regularization, which we believe is associated with the entropy collapse or maybe with what some people call the information bottleneck, although I say that very loosely, uh, in, the, in these networks. We've identified a taxonomy, which we call the five plus one phases of, of learning, which allow you as a practitioner to go and examine what your matrices look like and to try to tune the regularization parameters and look at this unsupervised network to try uh, unsu and using this unsupervised metric to determine whether you're in a good state or not. Uh, we've discussed how small models like the original model in that five or other models resemble this bulk plus spikes model, which is a type of Tenkinoff regularization. And we've demonstrated that as you turn up the regularization, for example, in our case, decreasing the batch size, you move from being what looks like bulk plus spikes or Tinkinoff to a scale-free, heavy-tailed self-regularization. So beyond that, uh, and that's sort of the practitional, beyond that, there are some imp broader theoretical implications. So that's sort of like the, the practical stuff, everything we've done. 
Now, the rest of this is sort of my rambling about things I think might be right based on what I remember from statistical mechanics and field theory. The, 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 the deep questions arise in, in the deeper question about why deep learning works. You know, there are all these open questions. Where are the local minima? You know, wh what's going on with the Hessian? Uh, are simple models misleading? Why do we need deeper models? Can, can we, you know, how, do we, how do we apply this? Uh, how do we understand this notion that there's a trade-off between uh, energy and entropy? And can we use this to understand the landscape? Well, one, one of the problems that this was motivated by, and I remember I told you at the beginning we, we talked a little bit about um, these ideas from protein folding. There, there's a notion in polymer theory and in protein folding that if you have a polymer and you're, and you're looking at its energy landscape, and a polymer is basically like a string, and the string may fold into a, a random coil, and you ask what the energy landscape looks like, well, the energy landscape you can imagine is fairly flat because any, any structure of the coil will do. And there's lots of local minima and little bumps, and it sort of looks like this. And as you begin to add correlations, you begin to add structure to the polymer, there are connections. Imagine you have a protein, you're adding disulfide bonds. You begin to, you would imagine that the, the global energy landscape would become fairly ruggedly convex. Now, this isn't my idea. And this, is, this was proposed by uh, Peter Wolnies uh, in a particular, in, back in the late 90s. Um, and it's called an energy funnel, uh, or a, a Wolnies ono cheek funnel. Uh, ono cheek uh, and Wolnies, we worked as ono cheek uh, was either, a, I remember he was a student or, student or um, a postdoc of Hopfield who invented the Hopfield network. So, I mean, these, you know, we were thinking about their people, not we, I was, I was too young. There were smart people thinking about this stuff in the 90s. Uh, and we were using things like neural networks to model protein folding, and there was this notion that the energy landscape should convexify. And what you, there was a model called the spin glass of minimal frustration, which uh, Ono Cheek and Woolies had proposed, and this idea that you have a random. Uh, and so I spent a lot of time trying to, you know, when we first started working on this problem, I spent a lot of time looking at free energies and random energy models, and sort of proposed that first. And then I realized that that I'm never going to be able to apply that. I mean, I can't, I can talk a lot about statistical mechanics, but no one would invite me to give a talk on statistical mechanics uh, of any practice. But I realized that what we see is sort of the bulk plus spikes, if you flip this around, kind of looks like the Walney's spin glass of minimal frustration. You have a model where you have a random matrix, and then you have these low energy states, the low energy state which represents the ground state. In, in polymer theory, the, this, there's a random coil state, and then the polymer sort of folds, and this is, me, this is for a protein. And so this notion that there exists a low-lying ground state for a protein, and it moves through this phase where it goes through the protein as the protein folds, it will go to the molten globular phase, which is sort of described by this random matrix, and then it ends up in this um, ground state. And this is a phenomenological model that Wolnies came up with to try to help chemists understand protein folding. And this is sort of what I first started. I wrote a blog post on this back in 2015, and then I, people called me up, you're on Hacker News, you're on Hacker News, and that was very exciting for a while. Uh, but I realized like, people might be interested. And then, then after some time, I, I began to think about it some more. And there are some older theories, older papers on spin glass theory, which demonstrate that when you have a, you know, this old paper by Lee Kun, this idea of a spin glass, or other people use spin glass models as well to try to model these things. Well, you're in the wrong universality class. You know, it's the wrong thing. Um, the, if, you, if you have a spin glass and you draw the distribution from a heavy tail, there, there's a pa there are many papers, that, the, the couple of papers that show this, particular by Bouchard and Sazek, I think, 1993. Oh, here, oh, sorry, you Forgive my French. you and Bouchard that show that um, the local minimum do not concentrate. And in fact, you get something like a funnel. So there's actually some fairly deep theory about this, and there's papers that, that, that show this. Um, Bouchard has worked on this quite a bit, both from the concept of using spin glasses and trying to derive the, the energy landscape this way, or using random matrix theory and showing that you get these kind of funnels. So we think that there's something here. It's not just, well, we're looking, we're just running, on, you know, we're running NumPy on these weight matrices and we're seeing these nice little plots, but that there's something more deeper going on and that the, we can actually make statements, or we hopefully make statements about the actual energy landscape itself, statements about it being more funneled than you might expect, what happens to the local minima, and this is sort of where, from a theoretical perspective, where we'd like to take the work. And that's, that's it, so thank you for coming, and do you have any questions? Oh, go ahead.
Well, I, I, you know, it would be nice to do an experiment where you try to throw the bulk out and see what happens. You know, in the heavy tail, there's no bulk. So I'm not sure which part you're throwing out. But it, it's, it, it's a quite, but on the other hand, it's not clear. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it's quite possible that the correlations are concentrate. And so, because you do, it, I, I say yes, it is reasonable because there is this notion of, of there's a huge decrease in soft rank. Like a 90%, like the soft rank on these is like 10%. So, yeah, you would expect that a huge amount of that is, it's just, how do you compress it, I think is the question. But yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. On the Hessian, yeah. Is this the stuff coming out of Google DeepMind? Or is it? Yeah, we didn't know that we did all this before. We didn't. That came out after we were doing this. That's very interesting. So, similar result. Right, well, we, we sort of are conjecturing that all the eigenvalues matter. But yeah, there are definitely in these smaller models, you have a, a concentration, a absolutely. But you know, I think that there's, um, yeah, I, 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 I haven't looked at the Hessian stuff that, that deeply, because we're sort of doing it from a different perspective. But it would, you would, the, the key for us is that you, know, you need to look at, act, you know, one thing we realize is that these small models don't tell us what's going on in big models. And you just can't, you have to, you have to run things at production, at scale, with big models to really, Otherwise, you get sort of trapped in this. Sort of, it, it, it might look like, oh, you can throw the bulk away and you keep these eigenvalues, but you know these models are tiny. So, you know, so uh, and we think that as the networks get deeper, as you get deeper and deeper, you get more. You get you sort of approach this scale-free picture. Yeah, 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 it'd be very. Right, that's an excellent, that's an excellent point of view. You know, I, I, I used to work in protein. I tried to, I did a postdoc once where I tried to grow proteins myself. I went crazy and tried to become an experimentalist. And any small perturbation, the thing would just wouldn't, you couldn't get this thing to get into its ground state. It would just, you add glycerin, you do something. You know, it was very, they're very, the fact that the theory is there doesn't, it's very, very, even, even in physical systems are extremely sensitive. And that's a point we hadn't thought about, but yeah, that's absolutely the case. You, you had a question, you were in. That's how, yeah, that's how, I, how I describe it, very crudely. Well, that, that's, that's essentially, you know, when, you, when you look at the, the, when I talk about the bleeding out, like this idea that, you have this sort of bleeding out from the, uh, that was a good picture, this one. The, the random matrix theory says that if you have, if you draw from a distribution with a certain critical exponent within some range, I can't remember, you, you'll get, instead of getting tracy Witten fluctuations, you get power law tail fluctuations in the eigenvalue. And then once you cross that critical value, then you get a, a, a full power law. So there is some theory on that. Um, uh, I, I don't know, for example, you know, is there some universal? Is there some universal critical exponent for deep learning? I don't know. It could be. It wouldn't be. I mean, you could measure it. You know, and that would be an interesting. Uh, that would be a very interesting question. If there's some universality across all these networks that you're approaching, or if that universality is characteristic of the architecture. Yeah, you know, we haven't we haven't gone to the great detail of trying to to characterize it, other than saying it's it's heavy tailed. Um, we haven't. Even, we don't even want to say it's power law. We just. But that would be very interesting. Yeah, yeah, you know, my, my advisor was a postdoc with Edwards, and in addition, who invented spin glasses. And he would always say, I, hate, I, I don't believe in any of the spin glass stuff, and I don't care about universality classes. So, but I agree, but I, I disagree. I think it's useful here, and it, it may very be useful. We just have to test it.
Well, we, we, we have a paper where we conjecture that this, this, there's this paper from 2017, which is why, why regularization fails. And sort of the conjecture I, I have is that, well, you, you've randomized too many of the labels, and now you've crossed, you've changed the capacity of the neural network, and you move from the, the, you've moved from the, um, the generalization phase to the glass phase, and you can't get out. And so you're, you're kind of trapped. From the, they're separated in that way, and you're trapped. And we sort of propose this as a, um, as a hypothesis of sort of a way of looking at what's going on in these systems. I'm, I'm not, you know, it's just sort of looking at the old theory and going, well, this, you can explain this with the old theory directly. So that would be very also, yeah, there are definitely those kinds of things. Right. Uh, sure, sure, sure. Well, you know, the, the, the whole theory, the old statistical mechanics theory of this stuff, which is this mean field spin glass stuff, which I'm, I'm not advocating is correct, but you know, there was this, because again, it's drawn from Gaussian spin glasses. But the idea was that the, the, the state of overtraining is a state which is, which is locally convex, but globally is pathologically non-convex because you have uh, essentially a replica symmetry breaking. You have an infinite number, you have a system which is infinitely degenerate and the barriers are infinitely high. And so that's, that was always thought to be the case of what is overtraining. Because if I draw the weight matrix, from one of these local, one of these locally convex sets, that's never that, that's never going to represent a typical weight matrix which generalizes because you 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 can because it, it, it breaks self-averaging. So that's kind of a we kind of talk see I talk a little bit about that in the paper about the idea that you know, when you apply we 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 do apply this to a case where we I don't talk about here where we randomize the labels. And I kind of kind of hand my waves and go, well, 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 in order to really apply random matrix theory, you also have to have self-averaging. And if you're in a situation where self-averaging breaks down, if, if you believe that and that's useful to describe, because those are mean field theories. They're not correlated theories. And you know, if you believe that, then that would be a problem. So uh, you know, there's some theoretical questions there that are you know, it's kind of nasty to work out. But the, the problem is that with the theories at it's mean field and it uses Gaussian spin glasses. And, and we, are, we sort of we don't suspect they're Gaussian and the mean field stuff, you know, you can get kind of crazy things if you don't, uh, if you don't add the correlations in. I'm gonna, you, somebody else over here had a, uh, yeah, what's your question? I mean, I mean the, the optimization problem itself, the, the idea that you have this, you have this, this energy that you're solving, you, you have this energy function, and you're minimizing it. Right, I'll go to the, I'll go to the, the original. Um, hold on. This this function, this function is an energy. So I call the energy landscape. I just mean the global landscape for the optimization problem, which is you know, however many gazillion dimensions it has because of all the parameters that you're changing. The you know it's exponentially large. So it's a fairly hand-waving kind of thing of saying that there's this, there's this very, very large energy landscape. In machine learning, they might call it like the, the hypothesis space, like the landscape. You're trying to optimize the problem in a very, very large hypothesis space. And as you train, as you do SGD, the space is, in our system, the space is shrinking without applying any kind of regularization whatsoever. And, th and that's the intent. Oh, any other questions? I thought I heard it. Oh, OK. Um, I, you may have answered this already, but um, do you see any uh, uh, changes in behavior with respect to the uh, weight matrix uh, eigenvalues based on the marginal and conditional distribution of the data? No. No, because we, we, you know, we, we looked at models that were already trained. So we looked at all these trained models, and then we just took minced and just basically adjusted the parameters in min, so we weren't looking in detail at the data itself. Okay. Other than, you know, but go ahead. Do you suppose that, do you suppose that, that would um, influence the, uh, that spread distribution that you would show to the uh, eigenvalues? 
Well, we, we, have, we have a case where we fit the data to, the, to a noisy system where you've randomized all the, all the labels. And in that situation, what we see is that the spikes basically move closer in. And so, you know, I, uh, more broadly saying, yeah, we, we would expect that the, the distribution, you know, obviously this, this is something which has been, even though the metric is unsupervised, it is applied to a supervised system. So these do apply to systems where the correlations are specific to the data. But I don't know, like, if you change something about the data, would that change the exponent of the heavy tail or something? I, I have you know, no idea if that would happen. OK. okay. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Sure. Well, I, I, I've tried to find the layers that are two that I can that are two dimensional. There, there are. It, you re, in here in Resnet, I have to look exactly. I can look, pull it up. Um, there are some of them where they flatten. If you go through, I don't remember if Resnet. If we look at the, there, are, there are a couple of you go through. They'll flatten them, and so you can project it down to you can, it, you can project it down to a two D uh, two dimensional matrix. There's not that many, but there are a few. Right. No. No, we're not. We're not. We're, yes. Yes. We're just adjusting one knob at a time, and we did it as a as a demonstration. Yeah. We're not trying to tune the system. And that, that's great. And we can check ResNet. I don't remember all the. I looked at so many of them. I don't remember. But I'll show you what I did in code, and you'll see. Okay. There's like uh, as you build these systems, you you every once in a while there's a flat layer. In between, and, and it becomes, and you can extract out the matrix there. Okay. Any any other questions? Okay. Great. Well, thank you very much.